anyone doesn't know who Janine is, she's currently the editor of BuzzFeed UK. Prior to that, a uh, long time at The Guardian. Won a Pulitzer there? Mm -hmm. did, did you win the Pulitzer? How, how do I say we, it? We, we won a team a Pulitzer team for, Pulitzer for uh, the Public Service Award for the Snowden story. Um, and the first time I met you in person was a couple weeks ago, and you were here to produce a TV show, which is not what I thought you would be doing when you were in New York. You want to tell me about producing TV for BuzzFeed? I don't know if it was technically TV. It was, it was a, 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 a five-hour live video production on screen. Uh, it was uh, Twitter for Twitter. Um, and it was uh, BuzzFeed's Election Night Live. It was, um, it was kind of terrifying, because what we did was take a whole bunch of people that have never in their lives done anything close to this, um, but all of whom were sort of exceptional journalists or um, entertainers or tasty people or um, brilliant uh, reporters. This is your version of Election Night coverage, but, but with people from Tasty and uh, there was a Try Guy there. Well, yeah, we, we had two Try, try guys, guys, actually. Okay. Yeah, two Try Guys. We, um, um, the idea was to sort of be BuzzFeed. So in all the downtime when there's not actually anything happening, instead of going, countdown to something happening, we'd go, oh, it's like a really good watch party. Would you like some cheese? We've got some cheese. Let's do a recipe with some cheese. And, so um, why, why does BuzzFeed want to make a live television or thing that's like television that I can get through Twitter? What's, what's the point of doing that? Well, I would say the first thing, I mean, we did one in the UK as well for the Brexit referendum, another stellar electoral result. Um, uh, I, I do not what hold BuzzFeed responsible for it at all. Um, so we did a five hour town hall debate with the Prime Minister. He's no longer in job. The First Minister of Scotland, she still has the job. Uh, Nigel Farage, who I believe may be coming here. He's not governor of Mississippi, I think. He may be by yeah. now. But anyway, so we had all these people and we did a, a five hour live thing with, with our audience and then on Facebook and with all the Facebook audience as well asking questions. And it was not a catastrophe. So at which point we thought this probably is a really great way to engage, you know, the mythical under 35s who will not engage with politics. Well, of course, they do engage with politics. This is really a great way to, to demonstrate that and to show it. And politicians in particular seem very keen to engage with it. So having done that with Facebook, we got a bit confident and then, and then um, did Election Night Live here. But is the thought, we have an audience that wants to watch TV, but TV isn't serving them, or they love BuzzFeed, and if they love BuzzFeed, they'll love BuzzFeed video. Like, what's the point of creating that thing? I think People are used to consuming yeah. you on Facebook or, or wherever they're consuming you in sort of short snippets. If they're watching video, it's usually not about news. It's about food or something funny. Right. I think that I think the journalistic urge is really pure, which is this thing is happening. Let's let's cover that. And what are the ways we can do it? Then there's the innovative urge, which I think BuzzFeed is superb at, which is oh, new thing. How can we do the new thing? Um, and and marrying those two things together. When in my previous life at the Guardian, we we sort of um, pioneered live blogging, which obviously at a later date you then horribly regret because everything is being live blogged all the time and feel really bad about. But when, when we started it it was such an obvious response to the internet being there and news happening and wanting to say to people, oh God, right now, this is happening. It, it might be different in a minute, but this is what's happening right now. And I think for this generation, a sort of video version of that, which is not dishonest and doesn't build up a whole construct around uh, the, the story, i.e. says, there's not much happening right now, so let's relieve the stress with some cheese. And then when something does happen, has some very nerdy and intense analysis that really explains what is going on. It's, it's a great way to tell that story. And what did you learn from doing that that night? It got 7 million streams, and in TV numbers, it's a much smaller audience, like 150,000. Like, is that successful for you guys? Is that an experiment? Is it both? I think we felt it was... Um, uh, it's really weird because we haven't talked about it very much because the impact of what happened that night has been so much bigger than whether or not we pulled off a Twitter live stream that it, we, we haven't really... We, we, I bumped into a few people in the office today and we were looking at each other like, I remember you, we did that thing. You remember when we did that thing? God, that was not a catastrophe, but we haven't talked about it. Um, it, it, was, it, was, it was pretty successful. The, um, the audience really liked it. Um, you could tell when it was happening that it was, it was working and the mix actually felt sort of fresh and, and, uh, and honest. Um, you felt the tone change through the evening. Yeah. And that sense that we had, you know, the point at which you kind of have less fun and the news starts so to really I was, crystallize. I was on site when was it started when and it felt like a party and then mm. I went home and... and it felt it, like a party because you were in and the then bar. I, and then I, I will confess at that point, yeah. I was at the bar, it was, there was a very good Hillary-themed drink. No, no, I had the Trump-themed drink. You probably had both. I probably screwed it up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just one. Um, <laughs> but I will say, as the night went on, I thought, oh, this is a serious thing. 
I'm definitely not, I didn't think I'm not going to watch BuzzFeed, but I definitely mm. thought I want to go to trusted stentorian traditional journalism. Um, do you guys think that's just sort of a vestige of the past and that goes away and it gets replaced by the BuzzFeed video? Okay, so let me answer that one in a different way. In 2012, when I was here watching BuzzFeed, when I was at The Guardian, I thought, yeah, they'll never be able to pull off this being their year in the election, and I was quite, quite wrong. And in, in the year that we've just had in the UK, um, uh, I have watched us go from... I mean, it's exactly the same trajectory as happened here, that I've watched us in a year go from um, BuzzFeed... They do lists and cats. Yep. To and now they go and now we're going to lead all the BBC bulletins on this BuzzFeed story and all the front page of the Times newspaper will say as BuzzFeed revealed, and it happens like that. So it might be that in video and live streaming terms we're just on the cusp, but it takes five, it takes five minutes with this audience. And one last video question. I mean, BuzzFeed does very well with video. It kind of drives the company, and there's a split between video and news. But the video that's successful generally on BuzzFeed and generally on the internet is not news. It's, it's something that's not time, it's not time specific, it's recipes, it's a funny cat video or someone dumping ice water over their head and it can be shared and it's not time sensitive and generally it's, it's kind of fun and, and lightweight. Mm. Um, you do real serious work at BuzzFeed mm. and have done the at Guardian. How do you think about transferring that into video? I think you can marry a... I think live is the key. I mean, that's certainly what I'm interested in. I'm really interested in, in, in how live works for news, and now live is... The, the access to live is so democratised by technology that we can have OBs all around the world, all around the country, um, for, for, you know, on FaceTime or on Facebook Live or on Periscope, because um, you don't need an OB truck, and that transforms how you can make an interesting live broadcast. That was when I talk about live blogs, the revelation for us was we could feed 14 reporters from a massive protest or a, a, a story and get them all into one story all at once, feeding in what was happening in the most recent time because it was like making CNN a live blog. Um, and I think, I, I think what we can do now is go, well, we're just, we're just going to do this in video. And I find that... I find that ability to marry tone, coverage, explanation, and, and a sort of immediacy, is, it, that's always what you want in news. That's a fantastic thing to do. So how did you get to BuzzFeed? You were talking about sort of watching it from afar and sort of gaining respect for it. That's one thing to gain respect for. It's another thing to go run it in the UK. You were at The Guardian. You were, you were doing great there. How would you get to BuzzFeed? Um, well, I went back to the UK um, after my three years here, which was, which was fantastic. We launched Guardian US here, and it was, just, it was a really golden period. It was a great time. I was saying to somebody earlier, it was like a fast-forward montage of doing a startup. If you, if, you, if you sort of shoved everything that happens in a startup together into really intense time, we did all of that. And, and then we were exhausted and we went home. Um, and, then, uh, and then I applied to be the editor of The Guardian. I did not get that job. You were in a bake-off. A lot of folks thought you'd win. I, um, you didn't win. Well, some people thought I'd win and I didn't. So... Um, Ben happily came over. He was coming over anyway. That's Ben Smith. Ben Smith, my boss. And uh, he, uh, we'd arranged to go out for dinner, and I thought I had not got the job. I'd found out on Friday that I wasn't going to get the job. And um, I thought, I'm not going to have dinner with Ben Smith on Sunday. That would be exhausting. And I'm just going to stay in my house and wear pyjamas and eat ice cream. Um, and then it got to Sunday, and I thought, oh, it's Ben Smith, though. He's quite funny. Oh, all right, I'll go and have dinner with Ben Smith. So I did not cancel the dinner with Ben Smith. And, of course, I walked in. And he said, um, should I be trying to recruit you? And because he had, had superpowers and he had learned, even though it was in public, that you were, you were out of a job? He'd spent the weekend with somebody else from The Guardian and he had very good sources, as ever, with Ben Smith, because he's quite a good reporter. And, um, and yeah, and so he offered me a job. He offered you a job and you <laughs> said, it's, I, know that I, got, I know that I'm taking the top job at BuzzFeed, but I don't want to go do the... I know I'm, getting, I know I'm not going to run The Guardian. But it's one thing to not run The Guardian, it's another thing to go work at BuzzFeed and start this startup. Well, I didn't say and yes over dinner. But, I had so a what, little what, think about it. What, what did you have to get over to go job. work? What did you have to get over <laughs> to go to go work at a site that there's a reason it's known for listicles and cat videos, right? They do that and they've done that, and that's one of the things that's made them what they are. Right. And also, by the way, they're really, really good at that. And we have a really great entertainment division who make fantastically funny, clever, brilliant things that move you and, uh, and that you want to share. And that's, that's an amazing thing that we all learn from all the time. And if you can't sit down with the people that understand how to make an ID post that you have to send to your friend with blue eyes because it's the thing that only people from, with blue eyes from Wisconsin will get, 
if you can't learn something from that about how news works and how to make news powerful and impactful and to get people to share it, then, then you're not trying. You know, that, that, those are really incredibly valuable things. And also, my kids love it, so that's important. The, 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 a lot of folks who create BuzzFeed created Huffington Post, and Huffington Post for years made a big show of hiring a, f a person with real journalism credentials from the New York Times, other places like that, and they would stay there for a while and they would leave. Um, were you worried that was going to be your trajectory at BuzzFeed? No, because um, and that is fair. That is a really fair observation, and that is a conversation. That, um, but I, ha I had seen, you know, I'd seen people like Mark Schuess and so on come to BuzzFeed. They didn't come in, do one story, and then fuck off again. They hired, oh, sorry. No, no, swear it up. I'm promised. I'm really We're all grown up. So there's alcohol I'm really here. sorry. Um, and the British newsrooms, they are sewers. Um, I, so, <laughs> so, so I, I, you know, I knew there was some time. We had they'd already hired Heidi Blake in the UK. She'd just joined. That was she's a fantastic, superb journalist who exposed FIFA corruption and you know a, a brilliant and admirable, incredibly young woman. And I, and I, you know, when Ben says you can hire a whole bunch of people, how many people do you want? You can hire very serious journalists. You can go on, come in, double the size of the staff do really great journalism, your job is to, you know, make us credible, get us, a, get us a real reputation for doing serious breaking news, plus grow the audience and make us a serious force in the UK. That, why wouldn't you want to do that? Yes, That's, that sounds that sounds now, in, in, uh, <laughs> that sounds quite good. Now, Ben Smith is in charge of all the serious news and news reporting, and they've split the company now formally, right? And so uh, his counterparts say, Frank does video, and now does the fun stuff, like lists. In the UK, you're doing all of it, right? Right, so yeah, we, um, we're too small to split in half. So we just are, we're just BuzzFeed UK and we're one team as we were before. And you made a point, it seems like from afar, of coming in there and immediately doing some serious investigative work. You did stuff with the BBC a, a couple times? So we partnered with the BBC. How does that work? We, it's, it's worked brilliantly. They've been fantastic. What does partnering with, with the BBC mean for, for a story? It means that you go to them with your story reasonably. You don't just sort of press release it when it's done. You go find a reporter who's around that area and you or in my case I go talk to the program editors and say you know I think this would work really well for your guys and then they you know we match up the reporters and we put them together it is um, a lot of a lot of media companies don't like doing it because they think it slows them down or they lose ownership of the story so or you've tedious. reported out a story or you're in, in the process of reporting a story we, we and you say do you want to work with the us? story and then we say right come um, assure yourself you know work, work on it with us do your additional stuff you know let's create you get extra most of the stuff way. that's for you we're, we're basic we've legaled it you know we know what we're doing but let's let's get this over the line together and give it full thrust it works really well when you're trying to expose an injustice and of course we learnt i didn't want to do it um, with, with the Snowden story, I wanted to hold on to it all. I was extremely greedy. I thought, this is our story. We've invested a lot of money in it. We have worked so hard, and we're flying all around the world on this. And um, Jill Abramson said to us, you will need the New York Times. You will need the New York so Times. So it's filled people was, in here. For, you, oh, you're so talking about Snowden? Yeah. Edward Snowden? Yes. You won a Pulitzer for that, and you worked with the Times reporting right. that and, out. And I didn't think, at the time, I was, I was so young and foolish, it was like five years ago, and I thought we could do it all on our own, and she knew better, and she said, you will need us at some point, and she was completely right, because there comes a point at which you are a 45-strong two-year-old news organisation in the US, it doesn't matter that you've got 200 years history, and there's political pressure, and there's a man from the NSA on the television every day saying that you're traitors and your journalists are... Uh, are vulnerable, and we did need the New York Times. We um, use them for cover, use them for journalistic credibility, and we use them also because there's so much story that actually there's a limit to what you can do, and you do need some, you need more firepower. If and you get a brilliant journalist, if you get a Snowden-like story, if a Snowden-like story shows up and yeah. the way it showed up for you guys, would you do the same thing? Would you right, want so to find? So now I know. Now I know that that's what you do. You and would we do use, that again? Oh yeah, we we worked with the New York Times, we worked with Der Spiegel, we worked with ProPublica. And similarly, in the UK now, we work with the BBC, we work with uh, Channel 4, we work with ITV, um, because in, in this kind of slightly diffuse world, you need, if you actually want to make a change and an impact with the story, it isn't about the headline that says it's your story so much as making sure that people have to respond to it. And, you know, for the next four years especially, we're all going to have this trouble because people are not going to be particularly respectful to the media or the investigative media, and we will all need to join together to amplify each other's so stories. So you think you're more likely to, to, to collaborate given, given the political yeah. reality of the world? Yeah, I absolutely, because you, you need to embarrass and shame and uh, inflame, and you need your readers and audience and the people um, 
the wider world to be outraged in order to do that to get the impact to get the change. Have you talked with Ben Smith? Have you talked with Jonah Peretti about the fact that the journalism is likely to be much more antagonistic now for the next four plus we, years? We, we have had those conversations. I mean, they're just starting to have the conversations here. We, we, we're a few months ahead of you guys. But um, <laughs> this, that actually wasn't a joke. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, I did want to um, ask you about that. I'll, I'll, well, you, you go ahead. I assume, I assume they're, they're saying yes, we'll go for it. They're an independent company. They have a lot of resources. They're, they don't have unlimited resources. If you said, look, this could be something that involves lots of lawyers. This is much different than cat videos. Are, are right. you on board? I mean, this is I, the, the thing I really love about BuzzFeed is the absolute bravery about it. That I, We've never yet had a conversation that goes, oh, I don't, oh, I don't know. That sounds, oh, no. Which is, you know, that's a conversation most of us that have worked for media organizers. Yeah, we all know that one. Yeah. We, we've never had that. You, you go, it might be something um, going on in Eastern Europe. And they go, oh, ah, that sounds good. It might involve um, Putin. No, fine. Off and good. That sounds great. Does anyone need a flak jacket? <coughs> um, and then, yeah. No, they're flak really... jackets. Yeah, yeah, um... Is there a BuzzFeed flak jacket? Oh, yeah, we have a, <laughs> a branded flak jacket. They get jacket. so excited. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you about Brexit. We need to go to the cupboard and get the flak jacket out. <laughs> um, we've talked about Brexit a few times. It has a similar contour to what happened with Trump here. Um, one thing that I don't recall seeing in the UK after Brexit is a lot of finger pointing at social media and a lot of discussion about fake news and really any discussion other than why did people vote this way. Uh, this, there's a bunch of discussions going on now and a lot of them are about is Facebook responsible, is Twitter responsible, having now seen both of these things up close. Why is there a difference in the discussion? Are, are they diff radically different stories? Well, I think, um, I think initially the, the UK debate was very focused on um, the, the, de the right-wing press, which was extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary, and, and the fact that the BBC changed the way um, it, it, it sort of positioned itself through the referendum and, in, uh, and did a sort of very um, even-handed on the one hand, on the, I mean, you'll be familiar with the dynamics of this debate. Yep. Um, on the one hand, people are saying that there will be an extra 350 million pounds for the NHS. On the other hand, people are saying there won't. And, and then the BBC reporter would go, so there's two sets of facts there and you decide. And that was a new thing, because generally we pay right, the BBC. Donald Trump says there was massive voter fraud, says the president right. and we, we pay a lot of money for the BBC, and we sort of pay that money so that they can tell us what's right, not, not, not that, so that they can lay out both things and go, you know, you, you decide. So there was, a, there was, and of course, much like here, you know, the media, the liberals, and, and, and the sort of remainers broadly were kind of outraged. And felt furious and betrayed by the media. And I think that did disguise what we are now learning about uh, who is funding what sort of propaganda campaigns through, through social media and how that worked. I think, I think the work that Craig Silverman and the BuzzFeed teams are doing, and now uh, Alberto Nardelli is doing in Europe, tracking where this money is coming from. I don't know if you saw the story he did about Italian media, the most popular political party in Italy is also the seeder of most, the vast majority of the fake news in, in European Facebook. And it's the same cash pot that's doing it. And we will have to, obviously all of us, track where that's coming from, but I think we've all probably got a fair idea about where it is. And, 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 and that's an extraordinary thing. Given that the, the BuzzFeed, earlier than most companies, uh, more prominently than most companies, said we are going to push everything out to Facebook and every other platform we can go, and we're going to go out and distribute our stuff widely. Um, if you do that, you end up distributing on Facebook where it sits side by side next to things from the Denver Guardian, which is not a new, regular, not an actual newspaper. Um, does that give you pause at all, thinking like maybe we shouldn't be pushing this stuff out? Maybe, maybe BuzzFeed stories should stay on buzzfeed.com or .co.uk and, and that people will know they're a real thing? Or do you, are you wary about the distributed nature of news? Um, no, I'm very wary about something that goes, if I don't play, then, then I won't contaminate my brand because I, I don't think that's the way. I think you, you, you're, you, know, you are trying to do something quite profound about in the news business, you're trying to do something quite profound about democracy and informing people and getting that message in front of everybody. That's your instinct, and that's the sort of the basic thing you want to do. You don't want to put it behind a wall. You want it to be everywhere, and you want everyone to have access to it, and ideally with your brand, which should feel like a bit of a kite mark, and, and different generations have different kite marks. I, I think the under, I know the under 35 generation feels very strongly that if we report an injustice or show something or explain something to them or say, that's fake, this is real, 
they believe, they trust us to do that. You want to be in the mix. Right. And, and you have to be there and be part of it in order to be able to say that's not real. I don't think it's a coincidence that BuzzFeed, which is so much part of the Facebook ecosystem, has led the way exposing what the fake news ecosystem of, of Fuzz, Facebook is. It's because we profoundly understand it. I read on BuzzFeed today that the staff of BuzzFeed UK uh, wants to unionize and they've sent you a memo. Uh, do you have anything to say to them or anyone here in this crowd? The, the staff here. Um, uh, um, uh, no, we got the letter on Friday. It's one of the, the uh, great quirks of um, the British newspaper industry that the, the letter comes, you know, the editor is king in the British newspaper industry, so the letter is addressed to, to the editor. Of course, uh, BuzzFeed, which is a global media and tech company, I'm very much not king. I'm just some woman in the UK that edits some stories. So uh, Jonah responded today. He wrote to all the staff and... Um, Oh, he's so eloquent about it, and I will mangle it, so uh, I apologise. He said, he said there are uh, two things that he operates in service of, and that is the public and the staff. And so he wants to hear from them what their concerns are over the next few days. And, Do you want to run a unionised shop? I think a, a lot of the UK media is unionised, and, you know, I'm, we'll see, we'll work the steps. See, I told you I'd have to ask that question. You and I said it. I would answer it. I've I have answered other the questions question. <laughs> for you, but there's a room full of smart people here, and I want to give them the chance to ask questions as well. So if you do, I don't know if there's microphones or if you're just going to stand up and shout. There's at least one microphone. Usually there's a shy person, and then it all gets going. So if you've got questions for Janine, who's very smart, please pipe up, or we'll just keep talking. They're all shy. They're, you know, they're, they're intimidated by the accent. Is it because of the swearing? Yeah. Oh, I'm really here sorry. Comes one. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, so I'm British. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's so, he's could, not fooled by a vowel. <laughs> but, but what I'm interested in is The Guardian. Um, so whenever I log on to The Guardian now on the app or uh, on the web, I am getting bombarded with appeals to pay money, to join, to do this, to do that. It makes me feel like The Guardian is not feeling very secure about itself right now. What's your perspective on that? Um, well, they, I mean, uh, the... the their accounts are public, they are, uh, are losing a lot of money. Um, I think somewhere 50 or 70 million or something, depending on how you um, count it, um, a year. And that's, that's a lot of money. The Guardian ha is, um, I mean, they've got basically about a billion pounds in the bank. They're not, I, I, They're funded by a trust. And they're owned by a trust. It is, it's an incredibly important thing that The Guardian survives because as a news organisation which has no owner, no other sort of uh, obligations in the world, and has an independent source of funding in terms of this billion pounds in the bank. That's, that's the thing we should all be really, you know, hope, hope very much survives and, and be quite invested in keeping going. Because we can all see what happens when news is owned by whoever pays a village full of teenagers in Macedonia to create it. Um, uh, so, so it is fundamentally important. I, in the end, you, if, you, if you invest a billion pounds and you have an annualised income of 20, 25 million pounds on the interest alone, it must be possible to make that work. I think they've got, they've got a really difficult journey to work out how to shape that. Did you, did you realise how bad things were when you wanted that top job? I mean, we, um, I, I knew what the situation was then, which is now obviously a while ago, but also I, I've been a media reporter all my life, and as you know, that makes us Nostradamus. So no, I, gee, so we're I, geniuses. Right, we did you have a plan? I could see, yeah, of course, you don't go for a job until you that plan. And what did that plan involve? <laughs> Cutting some costs. So, because um, <laughs> I thought, you know, ad advertising revenue could fall off a cliff pretty quickly. You, you know, it can do 30% in a month, can't it? And I, I think Martin Sorrell came out pretty much the next day and said, advertising revenue Fell has done its thing, fallen off a cliff. Um, but I, I mean, I hope and trust that The Guardian will be fine. They've just, they're going to have to reshape, and that's painful, really painful. Other questions from Americans, Brits, whatever nationality. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so, so you were joking about uh, uh, cat videos and listicles and things that BuzzFeed is known for, and then you made a reference to the, the, the responsibility of the news organization is to take those tools, take the things that are emotional and, and uh, uh, resonant and that can, then can have impact. Mm. Do you think in some ways that, that it actually might have gone, the, 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 we might have gone the other way, that, that, that all of the attempts to create content that's going to go viral 
has actually created an ecosystem and an atmosphere where things like fake news can, serve, can thrive because in fact we've devalued the, the, the value of, we, we, we've valued emotion over truth, uh, 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 you know, uh, anger and high emotion over, over reasonable debate and that all of the, that the world of the internet with, with all of the clickbait around it has actually made very fertile ground for people who don't want to have a serious discussion. Okay, so I think that's really interesting, and there are a lot of things in there that are not necessarily about fake news, but um, but we should unpick some of them. There are there is something about the uh, movement of store of information via emotion, which is a phenomenon that is relatively new. No question about it. And this is something BuzzFeed said. Hey, early on, we're good at this. We've figured out some of these levers. We've figured out what makes this stuff move around. Right. And I think, and it's a it's it's a way of communicating that appeals to people that didn't buy newspapers, that had stopped buying newspapers or never did, and. Um, uh, not to be too simplistic about it, our audience is, uh, certainly our audience in the UK is much more female. It is uh, much younger than the mainstream audience. In the UK, the media is basically divided into people over, I was going to say over 35, but largely over 50, who are reading newspapers and uh, watching television, and then people under 35 who are consuming BuzzFeed, largely. And it's sort of, it really is that straight, straight down the line. I think it's a bit more nuanced here. And I think it is... Um, it's really important to acknowledge that there are different ways that people communicate, and if they want to share stories, that's really important, and you've got to use that as a power for good. Clearly, the thing about fake news is something I don't quite understand yet, but is about wanting to hear what you want to hear. And, and, and we've all seen that over the last few months and years, that, that, that if you tell me what I want to hear, that's more important than actually actually even than what you said. But you know, it's something about how, how I interpret that. But again, that, that's then... what BuzzFeed got really good at and saying, oh, if you're a, like you said, if you're a blue-eyed person from Wisconsin, you'll want to share this. We've, we've engineered this, and it turns out that someone in Macedonia can do that too. Right, but what they're, what they're transmitting is not a sort of thing about whether or not you're blue or not. It is actually made up, and somehow that no longer matters. And, and that I... I that I don't quite understand. I think people are going to be picking this one apart for, for 20 years, and then we will look back at this decade as the decade of weirdly funded propaganda that was done via the internet in plain sight and go, all right. Um, I have one last question for you, and then we're going we're gonna, to gonna get off. You worked a lot with WikiLeaks uh, back yeah. at Guardian, um, and, and my perception of what WikiLeaks is and does has changed. I think many people has. What happened to WikiLeaks? What happened to Julian Assange? Are they the same people and same organization, or did something shift? Well, I think when he, um, I think when he went into the embassy, that WikiLeaks basically became Julian Assange, and um, he's in an embassy in the UK. He's he's in the Ecuadorian embassy. Right. It's just behind Harrods. And he's basically under house arrest. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah. Well, he, he not under house arrest, but he's, he's not he's under arrest. Up there. He could he could leave at any time, but he's yeah he's sort of confined himself there. <laughs> Um, uh, and there are police outside to arrest him if he leaves, but, um, but that's where he is. I went to see, I went to see him. He is, um, he's, that's where he is. That's how he lives, in the, in, in the Ecuadorian embassy. So it seems like he took Harris. an active role in, 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 the, in the U.S. election. Um, and he said, he'll say, that's, I didn't do it. I just pushed out information. I don't care where the information came from. It probably came from the Russians. Um, it certainly seemed like he had, he had decided he was going to weigh in on one side of the election. Mm. Um, did something happen to make him do that, or he just would have done that in 10 years ago as well? What I think, what you saw with Julian this time, and obviously the consequences, you know, again, history will prove, but it seemed, seemed quite dramatic to me. Um, you saw Julian unmediated this time. This was, this was WikiLeaks without the civilizing force of news organizations around him. Basically, Julian without a bunch of, as he would think of us, and has said, I'm not, I'm not putting words in his mouth, you know, sort of lily-livered editors who just censor everything and refuse to... Right. In the know, past, you worked with you guys end. and said, here's a bunch of stuff, and you right. guys would disseminate it. And we would, and we would go through it and filter it and work out what to publish. And, then, and, and we did the same with the, with the Snowden material, clearly, and, and were highly criticised by, by Julian and other people of the kind of let information must be free, put it all out on the internet... Um, campaign and, and, and you know that is a school of thought we, we always felt that it was important to apply judgment to make good choices to be able to justify um, not only to the people who didn't want us to publish anything but also to ourselves 
that what we were publishing was in the public interest, and that meant redacting, sifting, sorting. It's painstaking, it's expensive. Like I say, it often involves four so you, news organizations. So you think he's the same person, the circumstances have changed. If he came back to you and said, I've got a new, great, amazing thing, would you work with him? I don't think you get to choose your sources. I, I think if you're a journalist, you, you, you work, you know, if, so, if a source comes to you with a, with a, with a story, then you work with them. You work out how to work with them and the various different arms, lengths, relationships, but your, your job is to try and, you know, find the best way to tell the story. So if Julian, I mean, God, if Julian were to come to me tomorrow with a story, I'd be quite surprised. But if, if he were, then, then I would be really reassured by the fact that he'd chosen to come to us and, and wanted to work with us on, on how to put it out there. I, I think that was a really encouraging sign. Thank you. We are going to leave it there. You were great. I appreciate it.